Okay. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, today we're going to discuss the process for completing eligibility determination for a preschool promise. Um, this process must be uh, completed prior, prior to a child starting in preschool promise services, uh, working with preschool promise uh, providers to, um, to make sure that that happens. Um, and along with that, families need to complete the preschool promise application um, and the official eligibility determination that we're going to refresh ourselves on today, again, before starting services. And that kind of is how we consider that child enrolled in preschool promise. During today's trainings, um, we're going to cover uh, the place of eligibility uh, in the preschool promise enrollment process. We're going to overview the forms and requirement and the process itself for eligibility determination. Um, we're going to run through a couple scenarios on family size um, and really spend the bulk of our time on the um, eligibility requirements and then how to um, successfully conduct an eligibility determination. So focus really around family size, family income, um, and the requirements of uh, collecting documents from families to, to certify eligibility. So if we go through there generally, you'll see here the enrollment process is outlined on the Preschool Promise Enrollment Manual. Um, taking a step back, ultimately, uh, early learning hubs and their coordinated enrollment staff are charged with facilitating uh, coordinated enrollment processes in the region so that families know of all their available publicly funded uh, ECE, early care and education um, settings. They um, have an easy way to know what they might be eligible for in terms of different programs um, and know how to apply or enroll with those programs. Um, and really try to think about how we can use this to um, leverage resources in a community. So how to uh, ensure that families aren't occupying more than one slot um, and that uh, ultimately they are occupying the slot that most closely meets the needs and preferences that families have for uh, early care and education for their children. Throughout this, we're gonna talk about Preschool Promise specifically uh, as one program, but understand there may be additional programs that um, you all in regions are considering as a part of your coordinated enrollment process. Um, so just uh, acknowledge there may be some spaces where this feels a bit limited based um, from how you are uh, doing work in regions, um, but this is sort of the, the Preschool Promise uh, specific eligibility process and procedure. Um, so typically families would go through the following process. They'd um, be interested in one or more preschool promise sites. Um, they would uh, submit something to, you know, indicate their interest um, and placed in a community's applicant pool um, for interested families. And then when a vacancy comes up at a site that um, family, those families are interested in, uh, children from interested families uh, are uh, selected based on the selection priorities uh, and their eligibility for preschool promise would be determined at that time. Now, if um, a family is determined to be eligible for preschool promise, the child would then be uh, enrolled into that preschool promise vacancy and complete the connection to a specific provider uh, in order to start services. Um, and then throughout this process, uh, as coordinated enrollment staff, uh, you know, we expect um, that coordinated enrollment staff are maintaining contact with providers to notify them of the families that are selected. Um, and once determined eligible, help support that handoff of the family to the provider. Um, of course, supporting the family as needed to complete eligibility determination and any other enrollment paperwork. Um, and really available as that family contact in the event that there are concerns with um, a placement or a need to change um, a placement within Preschool Promise or to help connect to um, those spaces uh, that may be part of your coordinated enrollment process that aren't Preschool Promise. Um, to acknowledge that as well, you know, when, when families are um, expressing their interest or maybe applying to things, 
Um, you may find that they're interested um, or in a concurrent enrollment process. So, um, you know, many have spaces where families are interested in Head Start or another um, non preschool promise placement. Um, it may be part of your practice in coordinated enrollment to refer to other services and enrollment um, processes. Um, refer to 211 for any families who might want to learn more about providers and options there. Um, and it may be part of uh, agreements you've made with other programs to kind of um, take those referrals in-house. So I wanna say there's, there's a wide range of ways this might occur. Again, all trying to kind of maximize that family choice there. Similarly, if families identify or share other uh, needs or services they'd be interested in during, um, during their application process, many may have, um, you may have processes built in to um, refer or direct families to other services or again to to 211 as a, as a family support function of coordinated enrollment. Um, so all that to say, again, this is gonna look very preschool promise specific, but no, this is not, um, not indicative of all of the work around serving families with coordinated enrollment. We're gonna move quickly to um, some of the forms that are used in the preschool promise enrollment process on this next slide. So we know that um, many uh, early learning hubs are working with the regional partners and publicly funded programs um, to develop and use um, either a universal uh, interest or screening form or to create some common questions that would help support families uh, in whichever program they might enroll with. Um, you'll see that they may, you know, families might complete that form to, um, to help select either into or uh, into Preschool Promise um, in addition to other programs as well. Um, again, should the family be interested in and um, selected for Preschool Promise, uh, they would need to complete the uh, Preschool Promise application um, and also uh, complete the certification of eligibility. Um, that's typically the final step in the application process. It's, it's connected or attached to the uh, Preschool Promise application and is intended to be filled out in, uh, in partnership um, through communication between family and coordinated enrollment staff. Um, again, a complete Preschool Promise application must be submitted by all families who are enrolling in Preschool Promise and certification of eligibility um, should be done uh, prior to the child starting Preschool Promise services. I will take a moment here to pause and see if there are any questions that folks would like to ask um, or if anything's been added to the chat yet, Lindsay. The chat is still clear. <laughs> Wonderful, thank you. Okay, then we will continue forward. The rest of today's training will cover the requirements for certifying eligibility, methods for collecting complete and accurate information, as well as strategies for treating families with dignity and respect throughout the process. And you'll see where I have been able to um, identify in the Preschool Promise Enrollment Manual the resources and pages that you might go to look at uh, to learn more in depth. So who can uh, conduct enrollment or eligibility determinations for Preschool Promise? Um, anyone, anyone conducting those enrollment activities must be trained on the Preschool Promise requirements um, and the following entities may determine eligibility for Preschool Promise, uh, Early Learning Hub Coordinated Enrollment Staff. Um, tribal Preschool Promise grantees may choose um, to conduct their own eligibility if they, if they would like to. Um, and similarly, Head Start and OPK um, programs that have Preschool Promise spaces um, may also choose to conduct uh, eligibility using um, their enrollment processes and procedures as outlined in, through Head Start and OPK, as long as they are um, meeting the income requirements for preschool promise. 
So first, let's take a look at the requirements for verifying a child's age, uh, as well as their uh, living in Oregon status. Um, all children who participate in Preschool Promise must live in Oregon. There's no exceptions to that requirement. Um, you will verify that by collecting documentation with a parent or guardian's address. Um, that documentation might be a driver's license, ID card, a utility bill, or a lease. You can find a complete list of um, accepted documents on page 10 of the enrollment manual. Um, and should a family not be able to supply one of those documents, there's a supplemental form um, asking them to uh, attest that they live in Oregon and provide their address. Um, children must be um, three or four years old by the date used for kindergarten entry. In most parts of Oregon, that's September 1st, but there are a few districts that have a different date um, for kindergarten entry. Uh, so um, make sure to um, confirm with your school districts um, which date of kindergarten entry they are using. And you will collect um, proof of the child's age eligibility by collecting a document that has the child's birthday on that. Um, that might look like um, birth certificate, a hospital or medical record. Um, there's a full list of the acceptable documents on page 11 of the Preschool Promise Enrollment Manual. And should a family not be able to, uh, to access or to submit a, a document from that list, there's a supplemental form asking them to attest to the child's date of birth that can be accepted as well. Next, the next step we're going to look at is um, verifying income eligibility or foster child status. Um, so as a uh, reminder, refresher, family income must be at or below 200% of the federal poverty limit uh, to be eligible for preschool promise. The exception is that there is no income requirement for foster children. Foster children are considered categorically eligible for preschool promise, meaning that their status as a foster child and, and um, being within a foster child category is all the eligibility required. You will collect either income documentation or documentation of a foster child um, status in order to verify this requirement being met. Um, and as a just heads up, the uh, federal poverty level chart shown here includes 200% um, of the federal poverty limit, as well as 130% um, and 100%. We've provided that information knowing that um, for Head Start um, and OPK programs, they have income thresholds of 100% FPL with the ability to serve families with incomes between 101 and 130 percent of FPL under certain conditions. So this is provided to help assist in that coordinated enrollment effort, um, particular to um, programs that may have lower income thresholds. I will pause there and see if there's any questions about the overall um, requirements for eligibility. We'll be diving into um, family size and income in much more detail in the following slides, but I want to give space if there's any questions about those eligibility criteria. All right. And we will move on. So um, to determine the family's income, you first need to determine who is considered to be a member of the family for preschool promise purposes. This may be different from how families identify themselves, um, particularly focused upon um, those that are both related to the parent guardian and supported by the parent guardian's income. So we understand there may be different um, household or living arrangements uh, that have 
different um, definitions of family within that uh, and want to just acknowledge that for Preschool Promise, um, we look pretty specifically towards um, those supported by income and related by blood, marriage, or adoption. So uh, when determining family size, um, the first step is uh, identifying who are considered to be the parents or guardians of the applicant child. Um, a parent is defined as the applicant child's mother, father, other fi family member who is primary caregiver, a foster parent, a guardian, or the person with whom the child has been placed for adoption pending the final adoption decree. Once you've identified the parents or guardians, um, you would then determine who is living in the household with the applicant child that is related to the parent or guardian by blood, marriage, or adoption, and is supported by the parent and guardian's income. So these two conditions for step two must both be met to be considered a part of the family size for preschool promise eligibility purposes. We are going to go through a couple of scenarios to demonstrate some of the uh, potential unique ways you may um, find families, both how they are living and defining themselves or identifying themselves, and then how we might make, um, make uh, the appropriate family size calculation for Preschool Promise eligibility. The next couple slides. So in our first scenario, who lives in our household? We've got bio mom, bio dad, a one-year-old and a four-year-old. So our four-year-old is our applicant child. So we take our first step, um, the number one on the previous slide, who are the parents and guardians? We have bio mom and bio dad. And so what is the family size here? going to be four. Feel free to shout out some of these. I know it's a little difficult um, on, a, on a training or presentation like this, um, but I'll try to give a small pause for family size <laughs> to see if anyone's brave enough to, um, to share out. So as you can see, um, you know, the biological mom and dad and then their two children um, make up the family size in this first scenario. Next, we'll go into another scenario. So who lives in the household? We have adoptive dad, four-year-old, and dad's girlfriend. So four-year-old is um, our applicant child. We'll ask who are the parents and guardians. And we've got adoptive dad, right? So dad's girlfriend, though, might live in the house, might even be supported by um, a Dad's income is not related by blood, marriage, or adoption. And so with that in mind, what is the family size? That would be two. So adoptive dad and our applicant child, the four-year-old. All right, we'll take on a multi-generational household for our third scenario. So who lives in the household? We have a bio parent. We have the three-year-old, that's our applicant child. We've got bio parent's mother, bio parent's father, bio parent's 12-year-old brother. So who are the parents or guardians? It would be the bio parent. And then this is a bit of a two-parter. So what is the family size? We've got, if the bio parent is supported by their parents, we would have a family size of two, right? Uh, so we'd have the bio parent and that applicant three-year-old. Even though the bio parent's mother and father are related to uh, the parent by blood, marriage, or adoption, um, they are not supported by the income of the bio parent. Therefore, they are not considered in the family size for preschool promise eligibility. 
Now, if the bio parent is supporting their parents and their brother, we would have a family size of five. So that would include bio parent, the three-year-old who's our applicant child, the bio parent's mother, bio parent's father, and the bio parent's 12-year-old brother. So again, because they're related to the bio parent by blood, marriage, or adoption and supported by bio parents income, they would be considered in the family size. Got two more scenarios here. Um, we'll go towards a foster child. So who lives in this household? We have a bio and foster mom, bio and foster dad, four-year-old bio child, and a four-year-old foster child. So both of these children may be applicant uh, children for preschool promise. So who are the parents and guardians? We'd have bio mom, bio dad. What is the family size? So if applying for the um, biological child, the four-year-old, we would look at three. Um, we would consider that to be the um, bio mom, bio dad, and applicant child. And then if applying for the foster child, we, um, for purposes of documentation, consider the foster family size to always be one. Again, we're not looking for, um, we don't need to collect income information for the foster family. Um, or the foster child in this situation, they are categorically eligible for preschool promise. So this is our notation that there's a, a foster child in that family. And then our final scenario um, around shared custody. So who lives in the households? We have um, the four-year-old, our applicant child, uh, in one household, we have bio dad, we have bio dad's boyfriend and boyfriend's six-year-old. And then in the other household, we have a bio mom, bio mom spouse, and their one-year-old child. So who are the parents or guardians of the applicant child? We have bio mom and bio dad. And then what is the family size? We're gonna do a bit of math here. So we are going to uh, consider and count the applicant child, our four-year-old. And then if we look at bio dad's household, we have applicant child plus bio dad, right? Um, bio dad's boyfriend is not related by blood marriage or adoption. And boyfriend's six-year-old also is not related by blood marriage or adoption to the bio dad. In bio mom's household, we would have bio mom, um, again, bio mom spouse who is um, related by blood marriage or adoption. And we'd have their um, one-year-old also related by blood marriage or adoption to the applicant child's bio mom. So if we add that, we've got five people across two households. So what we would then do is divide the number of total uh, family members considered for preschool promise by the number of households. That gives us um, a half, two and a half. Um, and so we would round up um, to consider the family size for the applicant child to be three. Those are our scenarios. So I will pause now and ask if there's any questions um, I can help answer around family size and uh, determining how to count family size for preschool promise eligibility. Hey, Ann, I have a question around um, partial uh, partial custody or split custody and child support. So if bio does not provide child support or provides child support and does not have any custody, so he has 0% time, um, do we just 
we don't have to calculate his family size, correct? That is correct. Thank you for asking that question. Um, yes, if uh, there's a, a custody arrangement and child support is provided or is, is um, collected, then you only need to consider the household um, that is receiving child support when you're counting uh, family size and when you're calculating income. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for that one. Any other questions around family size? Okay, then we will move on to our family income sources. So once you've determined the members of the family for preschool promise purposes, you will calculate the family income. Um, you will do that by totaling all family income sources over a verification period. There are three options for verification periods and families are encouraged to present um, documentation of their income for the verif verification period um, with the lowest income total. So you can either consider the, most, the three most recent concurrent pay periods. Um, you can look at the previous calendar year or the tax year uh, for, for now, that would be 2020. And um, in the case of a recent significant change in the family circumstances, you may consider uh, the current circumstances to estimate an annual income amount um, based upon the, um, the most recent information if that has changed markedly. Let's talk about what counts as income. I'm going to do my vocal cords a favor and not try to read out to you this entire list. Um, it's also listed on the Preschool Promise Enrollment Manual for you. Um, what I will highlight is while most of these ask for a gross income, meaning before taxes, before anything's taken out, the exception to that is for those uh, families uh, or parents who are self-employed. And that we would look at net income. So um, income after the business costs of self-employment. I'll also note um, for college scholarships or grants, um, the only pieces of uh, like financial aid or, or support uh, paying for college or for classes um, are those things that you don't have to pay back. That might be the way to think about it. And you'll see on the next slide as well, loans do not count. But if you receive a scholarship or a grant, you're not expected to pay back. That is a countable income for preschool promise purposes. I will move then to what does not count as income. So again, you'll see um, quite a big list here. Um, in addition to those loans, anything you, know, you have to pay back, um, that those do not count. Um, also, you'll notice any non-cash benefits or assistance. Um, so employer paid health insurance, food or housing that's received in lieu of wages, and then um, any non-cash assistance like um, school lunches, um, food stamps um, or SNAP, um, those kinds those kinds of things do not count as income there. Also to note tribal benefits uh, do not count as income for preschool promise purposes. Then I'll move here. We've got some frequently used documentation. Apologize, the uh, text is a little small here. You can find this chart on page 13 of the enrollment manual. Um, include some commonly used um, documents for each of these things. I'll point out that new for 21-22, um, if a family is presenting a Head Start or OPK income verification, they are not required to submit additional income documents um, for, for Preschool Promise enrollment. Um, as long as the um, income verification uh, is for the applicant child, and um, indicates that the family income is below 200% FPL. Um, Head Start and OPK and Preschool Promise calculate income um, 
similarly enough that um, we can accept a Head Start or OPK income verification for as um, as a, a calculation of income. Um, also new for 21-22, um, if a family presents a TANF or SNAP letter, um, they are not required to submit additional documentation. These two programs require incomes that are below 200% FPL um, and have, have already uh, provided the documents to uh, receive those benefits. Um, so we would, we would consider those families to be um, eligible for preschool promise if they are receiving TANF or SNAP. Um, the same is true for certain um, Oregon Health Plan or OHP benefits, um, the adults receiving OHP. Um, if, if they are, uh, if adults are receiving OHP, um, the, those programs require incomes below 200% FPL. So again, would not need to require, to um, accept additional income documentation um, to, to demonstrate their eligibility for preschool promise. So you'll see some, some areas where um, trying to uh, reduce the, the number of times or places that families need to submit their, in, their documents of income um, in order to qualify for a publicly funded program or service. I'll pause here and see relating to um, what counts or doesn't count as income, um, as well as these kind of common income um, documentation sources, see if there's any questions around that I can help answer. All right. We'll move into talking with families. So um, in your interview or conversation with families, um, remember the uh, process should be confidential, professional, and respectful. And while it's important to practice due diligence with the income verification process, I ask you to consider the ways you can do so um, with as few barriers or burdens on families as possible. Some of these things we've talked about already include families are encouraged to present the documentation for the verification period with the lowest income total. Um, as we just mentioned, we've made updates to allow um, a benefits letter or receipt of benefits in programs that have lower income eligibility requirements um, to demonstrate, uh, you can use that to demonstrate income eligibility rather than recalculating their uh, family income. Um, and if families do not have access to documentation, supplemental forms are always acceptable um, uh, rather than asking the family um, to uh, try to, to come back with an additional uh, piece of documentation if it's not available. Let's talk about the supplemental forms a bit more. Um, you'll see these uh, four forms are available. So there is, um, should families not be able to provide documentation for all or part of the um, uh, verification period they'd be reporting income on, um, they can complete a family income statement. This may also be used for families if they're reporting no income, um, as well as may be used um, to describe their current circumstances if um, if going that, that route around verification period, if something's recently changed, this form can be used to um, describe, describe the change and the current uh, circumstances for the family. There's also um, an additional child supplemental form. So if there's a family that is applying for more than one um, applicant child, uh, so they might you know, be twins, might have, um, a sibling just to your younger, um, this form is available to uh, ask families to complete information on the sibling without having to complete the full preschool promise application. We would then be asking coordinated enrollment staff to um, attach that family information or that family application um, to the uh, to that child's supplemental form to kind of complete the application for each child without asking the family to complete two 
or more. Um, there's then a date of birth statement or, or supplemental form if uh, documentation with the child's um, birthday is not available. Um, the family can uh, attest to um, the child's birth date and we can use that as documentation um, of the child's date of birth and their age eligibility. And then finally, there's a address supplemental form if there's not a piece of documentation that um, is on the list of accepted documents for the Oregon address, uh, we can accept a supplemental form, a statement from the parent um, with their address um, in Oregon. Let's see, I see any questions on um, either the talking with families or supplemental forms and flexibilities there. Okay. So finally, we will um, we'll discuss how you document and certify the family's eligibility for preschool promise. Um, so as discussed earlier, families need to provide documentation of their income or child's foster care status, as well as proof of the child's age eligibility and that they live in Oregon. Um, Coordinated enrollment staff uh, will make and retain copies of these documents to keep with the child's application and later in their enrollment file. Um, and if the child's enrolled, the documents will be kept uh, for six years as outlined in our grant, uh, grant agreements and the Preschool Promise Enrollment Manual. Um, this uh, screenshot here is the certification of eligibility. So you'll see for enrollment committee use only, um, that's essentially for our coordinated enrollment staff work, asks you to kind of list um, the final fa family size, uh, the family's income, um, the annual income uh, estimated from the, the uh, documents submitted. Um, it will ask you to list the age of the child as of um, September 1st of the school year or program year that we're in. Um, it will ask you to um, select which uh, income threshold the families fall under, including ability to put in that you reviewed uh, SNAP, TANF, OHP, or Head Start um, documentation. It'll ask uh, that you uh, determine whether the family's income eligible or not and then which documents were used to, um, to verify, as well as which documents were um, used to verify the age of the family and that they have an Oregon address. You'll then be asked to um, determine uh, or, and check either eligible or ineligible or not eligible for preschool promise services um, and identify the coordinated enrollment staff member making that determination. And then there's a space to um, indicate where the child is, which uh, preschool promise grantee the child is placed at, um, as well as a space to record um, should the family choose to transfer at any point in the future, um, being able to keep that updated. The eligibility certification is good for an entire program year. Um, so should a family go through eligibility determination um, and decide, you know, for whatever reason not to continue to enrollment, um, if they uh, choose to come back or would like to be considered for the vacancies that are um, available anytime during the program year, uh, you'd be able to use that eligibility determination um, rather than having the family uh, submit additional documents or go through eligibility determination again. All right, with that, um, our final kind of overarching question time. Um, we'd love to hear what questions you have. And this is Tammy. Mm -hmm. Um, sorry, I have my video off because my internet is kind of sketchy out here. So um, I do have a question back to household size. Mm -hmm. We had a scenario of a dad who was um, had a 
uh, preschool age child living with him that he was trying to um, enroll. And then he supports five other children. And so his income was over, um, it was over income for two in the household because it's just the one kid that lives with him now. But he was saying that he, that the other children will be coming to live with him. So um, my question is, is if, you know, in that scenario, if the dad is supporting the one sending child support money out, can we do something, could calculate that in any way? Mm, I see. So, um, so sending child support, um, but the children, the five children are not being, uh, are not living with uh, dad currently. Is that yeah, the, yeah, five children. He's got six all together. One lives with him currently. The other five are not with him full time. Mm -hmm. So he's paying child support on five plus the one living with him. Yeah, I think, um, I think when it comes to calculating his income, um, if he's able to provide um, provide documentation that shows um, that the payment of child support is at a given amount, um, you would be able to uh, essentially uh, subtract that from his his income, um, his total income calculation there. And if you, um, I can follow up with you on that. A little further uh, to give some more detail there, um, and then of course, if the child, if the children do come to live with him, um, assuming they're related by blood, marriage, or adoption, which it sounds like they would be, um, of course, then at that point they'd count in the family size. Um, but I think in the in the meantime, for children that are not currently living there, um, there is that ability if he can provide um, sort of proof that those are child support payments. There's a way to consider that um, against his, his current income. So I can follow Excellent. up. Excellent, thank you. Sure thing. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing here. Thank you.